Alban Berg was a student of Schoenberg, who are often told that he was a serial composer, but this is not entirely accurate. Berg did sometimes use a series in his compositions, but he used it in a very free way, not at all like a straitjacket. By this I mean that many of his melodic lines and harmonies are not clearly derived from the series. Here's the series Berg used for the violin concerto. You'll note that it contains no fourths, no tritones, and no minor seconds. It consists of a pile of thirds with a whole tone scale on top. This creates a harmonic world that is definitely clearly audible. The variety of information is not overwhelming, as it is in a lot of other serial music. We would expect a piece based on this series to have lots of triads and seven chords, as well as whole tone scale passages. And indeed, Berg's Violin Concerto does. But Berg also has many melodies and harmonies, including minor seconds and tritones. The fact that there are many melodic lines and chords that have no audible relationship to this series at all. In other words, although the harmonic world created by this series is quite salient, the music often uses other sonorities unrelated to the series. Often they result of smooth voice leading, a bit like non-harmonic tones and tonal music, as well as other techniques, which we'll discuss in our next video. Let's look at some examples from the beginning of the concerto. Let's listen. Measures 1 to 9 are built over a gradually rising, mostly stepwise bass line until it peaks on B flat in measure 9. As it does in tonal music, this gives a clear direction to the harmony. The main line above that starts with an arpeggio of perfect fifths in the clarinet and harp, answered by the open strings of the violin. These arpeggios go gradually higher, peaking at the same time as the bass line in measure 8. Note that neither the perfect fifths nor the answer, which appears in measure 4 and 8 using tritones, are related to the series. The middle parts accompanying the violin, in measures 2, 4, 6, and 8, sometimes create triads with the violin, but they also sometimes create semitone dissonances as well. In measure 9 to 10, the arpeggios descend much more quickly than they rose, arriving at the notes of a G minor triad in the low register. But the solo violin holds an E flat, which is dissonant with the D and the G minor chord in measure 10. So if we had to deduce the series from this beginning, it would certainly not be the one Berg is actually using. Once the introduction is over, the next four bars, measure 11 to 14, do introduce the series, now as a harmonic progression. The upper parts move with simple standard voice seating over this bass line. But note how the bass line is presented as a series of leaps. This zigzag counter will become a motive, and it's used repeatedly in the coming measures. After this, the solo violin presents the series as a melodic line in measures 15 to 18. But the accompanying harmony includes notes that often create strong semitone dissonances with the series above. In fact, the accompanying line, played by muted horn, is a compound line with semitone voice leading in each register. Note how, while this is going on, the bass is a sustained E flat in the contrabassoon, which resolves to D in measure 17. The chords we see in measure 18 to 20 are actually middle parts, again with straightforward traditional voice leading. The real bass only returns in measure 20, C sharp, D, G. 
the C sharp is in a progenitory to the D, which then resolves to G, as it would in a simple chordal context in G minor. Then, measure 21 to 23, answer what the orchestra did in measure 11 to 14. This time, however, the relation of the chords to the series is not clear. The bass line has the same leaping motive, but the last interval is not a minor sixth as it was the last time. Rather, it's a major seventh. Once again, an interval that does not appear in the series. The upper parts in the trumpets are essentially a smooth series of suspensions. This is important because suspensions are dissonances that resolve, which implies that there's still a hierarchy of consonants and dissonance, with the latter resolve into the former. The overall world here is, of course, not as consonant as would be in tonal harmony, but there's still a sense that harmonies can be more or less tense and that they have direction. So although the series is sometimes present here, the bass lines and most of the voicing are built using familiar techniques from traditional harmony. And this makes sense because their logic remains audible. Here are two more examples of important motives that aren't from the series. Look at measure 54 to 57, the solo violin line. Although there are bits of whole tone scales and triads in here, there are also a lot of prominent semitones. The bass line underneath seems to start with a whole tone motive, but it's soon sequenced with lots of semitones. In other words, Berg is using semitones as they would be used in traditional harmony to create smooth connection between successive notes. The actual melodic coherence in these lines is more the result of the motives used in sequences than the series. Now let's move ahead to much later in the piece. In the last section of the second movement, Berg quotes a Bach chorale, as just genug. How does this chorale relate to the overall language of the concerto? Well, the chorale melody does start with a whole tone scale, presented the first time in measure 136 and following, and the solo violin over the series and the bass. But then, starting in measure 142, we hear the chorale in Bach's original harmonization in the woodwinds, while the violin comments with occasional bits of a whole tone scale. Listen. From here to the end of the concerto, the chorale recurs in various harmonic contexts, sometimes with normal tonal harmony and sometimes with Berg's own harmonizations, for example, measure 158 where the chorale is in the bass. What can we conclude from all this? Well, certainly some aspects of the piece's character come from the series, the piles of thirds and the whole tone sound. And this is possible precisely because the series is inter intervallically quite limited and therefore has a recognizable character. But this isn't true of all series. For example, here is a series that's much more intervallically varied. Would you really recognize this if it occurred, say, in the bass 20 bars after the first presentation? I don't think I would. So far, we've seen how the series, as well as traditional smooth voice leading, work in this piece. But that still leaves many aspects of Bear's harmony unexplained. To understand these other things, we'll expand our perspective in our next lesson. <laughs>